Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So what do we have for praises and praises? Okay, Start off with all my regulars. Okay, hold on. Get ready. Marilyn. Anybody else? Susie? Uh, people in Maui, all those fort, all those fires that they've been dealing with. Yeah. So, yeah, many, awful, so huh? many people have lost their homes. <coughs> That's just sad. <coughs> Anybody else? Holly? My mom. My daughter, Tammy, having some family issues. And two I'm smoking. Um, I keep, keep my co-workers, my guardian angel hospice family. We've had a lot of losses in our company. We've had four of my co-workers have lost parents. One has lost their spouse and one lost their grandmother. So it was, um, it was lots of loss. And then I have uh, a friend whose name is Ocean, and she is having some issues with one of her children. We've got uh, Marvin Good, uh, who I talked about in the Facebook group. Um, I have not heard any updates on him, but I do know that he did get transferred to St. E, uh, dealing with infections from bed sores, is what was causing all the problems. And then also my mom, who is feeling better at least the last couple of days, and we're praying that some change of medication and stuff will keep her going for a few more days anyway. Anybody else? Uh, please keep Tara and Matthew in your prayers. They're just both dealing with some things. Um, my my parent uh, of one of my students, just keep that family in your prayers. I, I believe she talks to the doctor tomorrow to see whether or not she's going to be able to come home. Um, I've hired a new aide for my classroom. So... Please keep that in your prayers, and I have an unspoken. <clears throat> Does anybody else have anything else to say? Or to add to the list? Kenny? Oh, my, my own ones. Oh. Our, our nation leaders. All the storm victims around the United States. in prayer hymn. We're going to sing page 414, Sweet Hour of Prayer. We'll sing both verses. And for everyone who can, would you please stand while we sing and remain standing for prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this beautiful day for us to share in the Lord's house where there's always so much joy when we're gathered together. And I pray for the people that we have brought forth for a petition, people that are hurting, people that have lost loved ones, people that just that just need you there, Lord. I, just, I pray for these families, and I pray, like I said, I always pray for this church and this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus clearly seen their deep devotion and great joy. 
Acts made clear they met daily, they worshiped regularly, and had a glad and generous heart. Jesus' followers had this internal joy marked with gladness, and it was not for themselves. Their outward-facing generosity brought joy into the lives of the people around them. So maybe when Jesus had taught them about the kingdom of God, he had shared how exciting and strange it would be to have so much joy that people would wonder and want what they had. Luke reports that they grew in favor with all the people and that the Lord added many to their numbers. So ask yourself if this joy is real for you. There are times when life can be hard and we can get discouraged, but it can also help to look deeper and see that joy grows when we are glad and generous as we look forward in hope. So, and I always, I like that when I read that, because it kind of reminds me, you know, when we, like we go to our family reunions, there's so much joy there because you don't have seen anybody for such a long time. And also the joy when you go to church when there's other believers. Because you know, if we stay together, we stick together in God's plan, you know what the reward's going to be. It's going to be okay. And it just makes me sad when I see people that don't go to church. Like on a Sunday morning, you're going by the ball fields, and I'm thinking, how many people are lost? You know, and then the, and our job is to get out there to bring them in. And so I, I don't even look at myself. Also, see, you know, I need to work harder. Also, you know, spread the joy around, you know. So, <clears throat> Should I pray? My <coughs> Father, once again, I'm just grateful to be here today. But there's always joy in your house. And I'm so thankful for your son, Jesus, coming down here. He died on that cross. That was such a horrible death. He, he went, I mean, you can't even imagine. That he loved us so much that he just wants us to be with him. And I just always pray to always encourage those around me and to always just spread the joy around me because you can always tell when you are in, when the Holy Spirit is in a person. I mean, they are a different person. So, just make pray.
that each hour that we go through our lives and we just forget to stop and say, Lord, was that you? Thank you. Lord God, take these blessings now today and use them to help further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning. Down in the south, there are many churches known as answer back churches. When the preacher says something, the con congregation naturally replies. One Sunday, a preacher was speaking on what it would take for the church to become better. He said, if this church is to become better, it must take up its bed and walk. The congregation said, let it walk, preacher, let it walk. <laughs> Encouraged by the response, he went further. If this church is going to become better, it will have to throw aside its hindrances and run. The congregation replied, let it run, preacher, let it run. Now, really into his message, he spoke strongly. If this church really wants to become great, it will have to take up its wings and fly. Let it fly, preacher, let it fly, the congregation shouts. The preacher gets louder. If this church is going to fly, it will cost money. The congregation replied, let it walk, preacher, let it walk. <laughs> In Revelation 3, 7 to 13, it says, write this to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Here's a message from the one who is holy and true, the one who holds the key of David. When he opens something, it cannot be closed, and when he closes something, it cannot be opened. I know what you do. I have put before you an open door that no one can close. I know you are weak. But you have followed my teaching. You were not afraid to speak my name. Listen, there is a group that belongs to Satan. They say they are Jews, but they are liars. They are not true Jews. I will make them come before you and bow at your feet. They will know that you are the people I have loved. You follow my command you to endure patiently. So I will keep you from the time of trouble that will come to the world, a time that will test everyone living on earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to, your, to the faith you have so that no one can take away your crown. Those who win the victory will be pillars in the temple of my God. I will make that happen for them. They will never again have to leave God's temple. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of of the city of my God. That city is the new Jerusalem. It is, it is coming down out of heaven from my God. I, also, I will also write my new name on them. Everyone who hears this should listen to the Spirit, to the churches, or what the Spirit says to the churches. Philadelphia is it's a city in Turkey, but it's now called Alashahir, and it was located about three miles southeast of Sardis. Like Sardis, this city was an important center of commerce and was like the other cities, flooded with pagan religion. There were also a Jewish contingency in that city that was having a significant impact on the church here. This church and the one in Smyrna are the only churches to which Jesus doesn't give any words of rebuke. The Church of Philadelphia was a healthy church. And if, you, if you've noticed, and I've said this before, each time that Jesus writes a letter, he introduces himself in a different way. And part of that is because he's introducing himself in a way that the people can relate to him. Um, this is our sixth church, and the thing is, each church read all seven letters. 
So if you notice, there's some repetitive words in each one of the letters. And if you research the Bible at all, there's repetitive words throughout the whole Bible. And the reason is because there's, that's something important. Like we said before, Jesus could have wrote one letter to all the churches and just individually listed them, but he didn't have John do that. He took the time to have John write each individual, individual church a letter. Because like I've said before, if we look at each one of these letters, we can see a little bit of us in each one of them. Sometimes we feel like maybe we've lost a little bit of God. And we need to regain that. Sometimes we feel like everything we do is doing wrong is wrong. We don't want to do it, but we do it anyway. And then there's times that we're, we feel like we're doing right, but we're being persecuted. God says that's what that's what part of being a Christian is, is being persecuted. Having them trials, having them tribulations. Because each time that we go through a trial, we move up. See, a lot of people don't like trials because they're hard. They make you feel worse than you've ever felt before. But each time you go through a trial, you come out on the other side a little bit higher than what you were before. You got a little bit more knowledge. You can help a few more people. In verse 7, he says, Write this to the, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. Here is a message from the one who is holy and true, the one who holds the key of David. When he opens something, it cannot be closed, and when he closes something, it cannot be opened. Jesus calls himself the Holy One. If we look throughout the, Bible, the Old Testament, this is the term God used. A lot to describe himself that he was the Holy One. This designation reveals Jesus' deity and his divinity. Jesus is affirming that he is God to this church in Philadelphia. Why would he need to affirm himself? They live in a pagan society. When you live in a pagan society, you've got to test the teachers and the prophets. We live in this world. We should be testing people to make sure they're true Christians. A lot of times, the way you test is you see them in different events. You hear them speak. I mean, I met Dustin back when he was a teenager. And, but, I've been on Torch teams with him. I've been on Kairos teams with him. I've been to his church. He's now been to mine. We've, we have interacted in several different dimensions of the Christian lifestyle. We know each other through our Christian lifestyles. Of course, I hate to say it, his dad ran around with my brother, so that helped a little bit too. <laughs> but with all these believers who were suffering for Jesus, it would have been important for them to be reminded who they were suffering for. Don't we need a reminder every once in a while? Sometimes don't we forget why we're suffering? Why do you think we have prayer and praise? It's to help show other people that we care too. Bible study I do on Monday nights. Uh, girl, she lives in Texas, got on one of those little scooter things and crashed it. She had emergency surgery on Monday. They had to put plates and bolts and everything and basically rebuild her ankle and pulled it together. But the, but the thing of it is, our group got together and we prayed for her as a unit. You know, there's opportunities that we take to pray for different people's family members. But, and here's the question I'm going to ask. Have you went to that family member or that person that you put on the prayer list and prayed for them personally? Because you know them enough to know that they've got problems, but if you prayed for them personally, 
have you went to them face to face? Not in here, but face to face, pray for them. Isn't that important? That, isn't that what the word says? When someone says, hey, can you pray for someone? How many people stop and pray right there? I do, because otherwise I'm going to forget. I'm sorry, but I will forget. So I have to stop right there and pray for them. As you guys are giving me the list, and it really is hard when I'm up here because I'm sitting there going, okay, how am I going to pray for these people while I'm writing this stuff down? Because I will forget. Life gets in our way. This church, life got in their way, but they kept their focus on Christ. Jesus calls himself the true one, and I think he did that because the Jews that were claiming to be the true Jews were persecuting this church. When Jesus says who he is, that means that's who he is. And he calls the Jews false Jews. How many times do we see false Christians out there? How many businesses put their name, put some sort of Christian name attached <coughs> to the business title to get more business? He says he's the one that has the key of David. And what he opens, no one closes. And what he closes, no one opens. You ever want to experience a true experience of this? Go to prison. Because the guard has the key. And if you don't have the key, you can't go, you're very limited on where you can go without that key. The hospital is just about as bad. But if you don't have that key, you have no power. You are at the mercy of somebody else. And that's what Jesus is saying. He holds our key. He's going to open doors to you that nobody can close except you. He's going to close doors that nobody can open, not even you. How many doors have we closed because we were too afraid to go through them? How many doors have we closed because we didn't have the faith that Christ was going to get us through it? Jesus takes that authority to another, another level when he says that he is the one that opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one will open. But how many times have we done that? I know what you do. I have put before you an open door that no one can close. I know that you are weak, but you have followed my teaching. You were not afraid to speak my name. We don't know why this church is weak. He doesn't go into detail. But the thing of it is, we're looking at God's logic, upside, upside down logic. What do people look for? They look for strength. They look for power. They look for everything that we don't look for. They look on the outside. Jesus looks on the inside. <coughs> They're weak. Maybe they were a small church. Maybe they were Rockville church. But the size didn't matter. What mattered was the heart. Remember, Ephesus was, and so far, Ephesus was the only one that Christ has threatened to take away their candle. And they're the only church that he said, You have lost your first love. They did everything else right. You can do everything right, but if you miss that one thing, it can cost you everything. God uses, he blesses, and he typically gives great grace to believers in churches that are not outwardly impressive to the world. We have a lot of blessings that we've been blessed with. We've got a a lot of people in here that love, love, love. We got a lot of people that care. There's mega churches that don't have the relationship that we have here because there's too many people to know anybody. 
you get a little play and you stick with that little play. I mean, it's funny because, like I mentioned, I've got a torch family, I've got a great banquet family, I've got a um, Bible study family, I've got a Pisgah family, I've got a Life Song family, I've got a Rockfield family. How many families do we have? Do we keep ourselves surrounded by people? My wife's back there going, you never said a word about us. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the thing of it is, how many people do you know that you can go to and call and say, hey, I need help, and they're there? They don't ask what you need. They don't ask how long it's going to take. They don't ask that. We give up our weekends for Torch and for Kairos. We don't really give them up because remember what I said, you know, true servanthood, there are no sacrifices. If you want to watch TV, in reality, don't you sacrifice something? If you want to go to the movies, don't you sacrifice something? Because you got to put something aside to do it. But do we sacrifice to read the Bible? Do we sacrifice to pray for somebody? See, we say, well, we shouldn't be sacrificing to pray, right? We don't look at it as a sacrifice. Verse 9 says, listen, there's a group that belongs to Satan. They say they are Jews, but they are liars. They are not true Jews. I will make them come before you and bow at your feet. They will know that you are the people I have loved. How many times have we read in the Bible and throughout the Bible that Jesus is going to let our enemies bow at our feet. But how many of us will truly believe that? If we did, we wouldn't try to get revenge on ourselves. If we keep, did, we wouldn't have grudges against them. If we truly believe what Jesus' word says, why wouldn't we love them and forgive them and let them deal with them? Like I said, we when people come to a lot of churches, they try to fix them. You need to do this. You need to do that. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. But the thing of it is, that's not for us to do. All we're to do is love them. Welcome them in, love them, and then it's between them and God. We teach them about God. God takes care of the rest. But how many times do we not have enough faith that God's going to do what he says he's going to do, and we try to do it ourselves? How many times do we do that in our own lives? Christians were no longer identified as they had been initially as a sect of Judaism. By this time, opposition to the church by the Jews was often violent. First century Jews saw followers of Christ as fools who were part of a perverse, blasphemous cult. We've never had, we've never accused anybody of being part of a cult when they believe differently than we do, have we? When people believe differently than we do, do we criticize them or do we just love them? It's hard not to criticize them because you want to say, you need to know Jesus. But the thing of it is, if we would show them the love of Jesus, we're more likely to get their attention. A genuine Jew in God's sight is one whose circumcision is of the heart by the Holy Spirit. See, in the Old Testament, it's physical. In the New Testament, it's spiritual. See, a lot of people don't connect circumcision of the heart to circumcision in the Old Testament. But that's what God was preparing us for. He was showing us that a part of us can be cut off and we can live better lives. You follow my command to endure patiently so I keep you from the time of trouble 
that will come to the world. A time that will test everyone living on earth. He's promising to protect them during the wrath of God. Do we believe that he's going to protect us? If not, why? See, the thing of it is, we live by our five senses. And I'll, I'll screw them up, so. <laughs> but we got touch, we got smell, we got sight, we've got hearing and taste. I'm glad people were helping me. <laughs> <laughs> but we live by those five senses. But we don't believe what Christ says because we can't see, touch, taste, hear, or smell. But we believe Satan may cause us problems in our lives. Why do we trust more Satan than we do God? How many times have we said, well, Satan did this, Satan did that, but then something happens and then we say, wow, that's a miracle. No, Jesus did that. Wow, they were really lucky. No, Jesus did that. But see, we didn't see him do it. We couldn't hear him do it. It didn't, it didn't touch one of our senses. But Satan, something bad happens, and well, Satan's at work again. Did you see him do it? So we have more faith in Satan than we do with God. Hollywood talks more about spirits than we talk about the Holy Spirit. Hollywood talks more about Satan than we talk about Satan. Because we're afraid. If we don't talk about it, that happens. If we don't talk about it, it's not real. I've said that several, several times. But it's the truth. The traditional view is that when Jesus says that he will keep you from the hour of trial, the verb keep actually means that he will guard in the midst of the trial. Not that you're not going to be go through a trial. But he's going to be with you in the midst of it. How many of us thank God for our trials? I always do because I know that when I come out of it, the next step, I'm moving up. I'm, I'm getting closer. I'm building that relationship even more. I am coming soon. To hold on to the faith you have so that no one can take away your crown. You know, when we pray a lot of times, and I've told you I really need to do a series on prayer, but when we pray a lot of times, we don't see results. Sometimes we see results right away, and we think God really answered that prayer. But when we don't see results right away, we think God didn't answer that prayer. But the thing of it is, if we look in the book of Daniel, he, Daniel prayed the first time, and he got his answer in three minutes. He prayed the second time and got his answer in three weeks. How many of us have stopped praying for it on the 20th day and didn't pray for it the 21st day? What if Daniel would have stopped? He would have never got his answer because he'd given up faith. But he did. He prayed that 21st day. How many times have we stopped praying the 20th day? See, these Philip, this church in Philadelphia, they were being persecuted. They were struggling to find work. They were struggling financially, probably. They were a small church. They didn't have a lot of influence. They're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? How are we going to grow? But through all of it, they knew that God was in charge. How many times have we sat there and go, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? How am I? Why are we saying I have? Why are we saying, God, thank you for fixing this. I know you've already done it. See, the problem is, through all of this, they kept their faith. But sometimes a little trial can cause us to question our faith. We're being persecuted. Nobody's persecuting us. 
We don't have to come to church in secret and hope that nobody sees us walk in. But there's countries out there that do. There's countries out there that rip out pages of the Bible and memorize it and then hand it to the next person so they can learn that. We've got the whole book. We know the beginning, we know the end. We know everything in between. But are we taking advantage of learning that and seeing how that the whole Bible is really just one big story? Everybody wants to separate Old Testament, New Testament, book of Genesis, book of James, book of John. But if we look at it, it all intertwines. It's all one big story. I was talking to a guy the other day. He said, I only read the Old Testament. I was like, okay, but aren't you, don't you believe Christ died for your sin? And he's like, yes, I've been baptized. I said, then why aren't you reading the New Testament? Well, because all I ever read is the Old Testament. That's the only part I believe. I don't really believe it in the New Testament. I said, then how are you building a relationship with Jesus? Because, see, Jesus is in the New Testament. There are a lot of churches that only study the Pentateuch. Because they don't believe Christ is king yet. Look at the opportunities they're missing out on. And the thing of it is, a lot of them are going to more modern churches because they're starting to realize that Jesus did die on the cross and he has forgiven us of our sin. We don't live in a spiritually friendly or even spiritually neutral environment. You get out in front of people and you start talking about the Holy Spirit and see how many of them stick around. Because they don't want to deal with it. All they want, but, they, but yet then they'll spend $20 to go to the movies and watch it on the big screen about haunted houses, possessed people. But when you get out in front of a congregation and talk about it and say, it's real, it's out there, they start getting scared. Well, I'm afraid of the demonic world. How can you fight an enemy if you don't know who they are? Genuine believers, his warnings are always ultimately heeded, and by heeding these warnings, they're preserved until the end. Genuine believers work on what Jesus tells them to work on. Other people make excuses that they're good enough. I don't need to work on that because I know John out there, he's he's a lot worse than I am. He's doing a lot worse things than I am. Carol, she gossips all the time. We can't trust her. But you can trust everything I say. See, we always compare. But see, Jesus here is saying, no, you're individuals. And I'm going to judge you individually. See, I can have faith in me, but I can't have faith in my wife. I can't have faith in my kids. They've got to have that faith. And sometimes it stinks, especially when your kids don't follow the way you want them to. And I'm, I was that kid, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but it's hard. Because you want to be like Job and make sacrifices for your kids. Because you know their lifestyle. But you can't. You can only control what happens to you. Those who win the victory will be pillars in the temple of my God. I will make that happen for them. They will never again have to leave God's temple. I will write on them the name of my God name of the city of my God. That city is New Jerusalem. It is coming down out of heaven. For my God, I will also write my new name on them. Everyone who hears this should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. We're six weeks in. Has, have you been listening to what the Spirit has said to these churches? See, because He's not only talking to a building. He's talking to each one of us individually through these scriptures. He introduces himself different in each scripture. 
He's introduced himself to you right where you're at. He has given each one of them different warnings and things to work on. He's been talking to you. He's been talking to me. This series, I have absolutely loved this series so far, and I'm sort of bummed that next week you're not going to hear the, about the seventh church. You've got to wait another week. But the thing of it is, have you been listening to what the Spirit tells you the same way he talked to these churches? Have you found weaknesses in your armor that you didn't realize were there? Have you found strengths in your armor that you didn't realize were there? See, the thing of it is, each one of us has to look at these as an individual. We can't look at them as a team. We can't look at them as a group. We can read them and go through them as a team and group, but to truly look at them, we've got to look deep in ourselves. We don't want to be like Ephesus. We don't want to lose that first love. Yes, we're going to make mistakes, but the thing of it is, if we read these letters, God gives us an opportunity to correct them. He gives us time to correct them. He's given the Jezebels, who are pulling people away from the church, time to correct their mistakes. He's given them opportunities. It's up to them to take it, though. No one can take it for them. No one can take it for you. So, please study these again. Read them again. I've read them probably half a dozen times. I enjoy them. Because it shows me things where I might be a little bit short. I know. I always, right? <laughs> Let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for everybody that showed up today. Father, I want to thank you for the blessings you have given us. I want to thank you for the opportunities that you have shown us. And I want to thank you for just being you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sacrifice he made, giving his life on the cross, suffering a tremendous death, and he rescued his sinners, providing them <coughs> eternal life. We're very thankful that you can show us that love at all. <coughs> Our Father, I thank you all for those here. Be with those that are here, with all those on earth. I pray that each one of us can each other with prayer about what's going to mean. And now too, I ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn is found on page 90, Spirit of the Living God.